In 1911, Lansky's family, along with a young Meyer, emigrated to the United States after having experienced a life of pogroms and persecution in their native Russia, typical to Jews in Eastern Europe at this time. His family settled on Grand Street in the heart of New York City's Lower East Side. Growing up in a Jewish neighborhood surrounded by Irish and Italian neighborhoods, Lansky quickly learned to stand up for himself. Despite his diminutive size, Lansky immediately established a reputation as someone who would always fight back whether or not he was outnumbered, outmatched, or outsized by the wolf packs of boys from the surrounding neighborhoods. Famously, as a young boy, Lansky fiercely defended himself against a group of other Sicilian youths who were roaming the neighborhood looking for Jewish boys to extort protection money from. The leader was so impressed with Lansky's tenacity and fearlessness in standing up to the group that the leader let Lansky off the hook. That day, a lifelong bond of mutual admiration and respect was formed between the two, who in later years would become business partners and staunch allies. The leader of the Sicilians was a teenage Charles Lucky Luciano. Another such tale of Lansky's integrity, strength, and pride in his identity was when a teenager, he played basketball with a group of Irish boys who had the utmost respect for Lansky's skills as a ball player. Knowing that he was a Jew, the boys asked Meyer if they could call him by the name Mike so that none of the other kids would know he was Jewish. Meyer refused. Once again, Lansky gained a high level of respect for standing up for himself and his identity. Growing up in the Lower East Side, a teeming immigrant neighborhood, which at the time was a hotbed of corruption and vice, packed with brothels and gambling dens, both indoors and openly out in the streets like Delancey and Rivington, Lansky quickly felt an affinity for his shady characters that roam this world, as well as the darker side of the life and art of turning a quick buck. After finding himself on the wrong end of con games at one of the open-air gambling dens, Lansky resolved to make himself an expert in the ways of gambling. He soon discovered that with this combination of street smarts, leadership qualities, and incredible knack for mathematics, he could excel in gambling, along with other illegal activities. It was on these streets where as a teenager he met a wild-tempered teenager named Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, who Lansky took under his wing as a mentor. By the early 1920s, Meyer, along with Lucky Luciano and Bugsy Siegel, had become partners in various rackets including bootlegging, liquor hijackings, and labor extortion. Lansky and Siegel and their associates came to be known as the Bug and Meyer mob. Lansky also soon found a mentor in Arnold Rothstein. Rothstein recognized a kindred spirit in genuine brains in Lansky and helped educate him on how to treat his criminal enterprises more like a true business rather than street hoodlums. In 1931, after helping his now business partner, Luciano, orchestrate the elimination of the leading mustache Pete's of the day, Big Joe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano, Lansky, Luciano, Vito Genovese, Lepke Bookhalter, Frank Costello, Joe Donis, and Bugsy Siegel all loosely partnered in a Jewish-Italian coalition of organized criminals who controlled most of the corruption and rackets in New York City. Lansky and Luciano's friendship, mutual admiration, and respect led to a loosening of the unwritten set of laws governing inter-ethnic relations, which at one point was the main reasons why they sought to remove the Mustache Peets, because of their narrow-minded view that Italians should only stick with Italians. Variously referred to as the Syndicate, the Combination, or the Big Five, the idea was that crime should be treated like a business, in the manner in which Rostin had taught them. No longer were tribal vendettas waged or territories encroached on. The group acting as a committee made communal decisions about whether a certain offense deserved the ultimate punishment or if there was alternative means to resolve grievances. After Prohibition's demise in 1933, Lansky set about diversifying his business operations, attempting to invest in both legitimate and illegitimate enterprises. His primary source of income, however, remained gambling. Throughout the 1930s, he opened up several carpet joints, meaning they were so fancy that they had carpets, gambling locations in upstate New York, New Orleans, and Florida, as well as making inroads into gambling operations in Cuba. He also invested heavily in dog tracks in Hollandale, Florida, the base of his gambling universe. Lansky's biggest innovation was that he never cheated his customers. He understood that since the odds were in the house's favor, it made no sense to try and rip off the clientele, and that Lansky enforced a zero-tolerance policy towards cheating, especially among his dealers and the rest of his employees. With his math wizardry, gambling integrity, business skills, and especially his ability to curry the favor of local mobsters to secure his locations and through bribing local law enforcement, Lansky became one of the major players in the illicit and growing gambling industry. 
During the 1930s, there was a burgeoning American Nazi movement throughout the United States. When the Nazi rallies were publicized, there were often protests, particularly from Jewish groups. Although it was kept quiet, mainstream Jewish leaders actively sought the help of Jewish gangsters to use militant tactics against the Nazis by disrupting these events with stink bombs, fists, and lead pipes. While Abner Longy's woman led these efforts in Newark, New Jersey, Lansky led them across the Hudson in New York City. Although Lansky was offered money and legal assistance to break up Bund rallies in New York City, he refused the money, saying, We wanted to teach them a lesson. We wanted to show them that Jews would not always sit back and accept insults. For Lansky, it was personal. The attacks were led with military precision, usually involving gangsters both planted inside and outside the events to trap the Nazis. At a pre-range time, the signal would be given and all hell would break loose. As Lansky described one such event, quote, we attacked them in the hall and threw them out of the windows. There were fist fights all over the place. Most of the Nazis panicked and ran out. We chased them and we beat them up, and some of them were out of action for months. There were no killings or permanent injuries at these events, only dislocated limbs and bloodied heads and noses. During World War II, at the bequest of the United States Navy Intelligence Department, who were looking to secure the New York City docks and waterways from enemy spies and sabotage, Lansky was asked to act as a conduit between them and Luciano, who was then imprisoned at Dannemora Prison in upstate New York, serving a sentence of 50 years. Feeling that it was his duty as a U.S. citizen and longing to see his old friend, Lansky agreed to help. Luciano eagerly agreed as well, and because he was such a great help to the war effort, he was released early from prison immediately after the war. Over the course of the war, several visits were made with Luciano in prison, and from time to time he agreed to help until the end of the war. The ports and the docks in New York City were kept safe from enemy infiltration and sabotage. In the mid to late 40s, Lansky became one of the primary investors in Bugsy Siegel's construction of the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada which had a rocky financial start, with cost overlays galore. Soon after the Flamingo was opened in 1947, Siegel was gunned down in Beverly Hills. Although the murder was never solved, rumors immediately began hinting that Lansky begrudgingly approved the hit after years of financial overlays and financial discrepancies at the hotel. Around this time, during a stay at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York, it was mutually agreed upon that, in exchange for kickbacks, Cuban President Batista would offer Lansky and the Mafia control of the country's casinos and racetracks. Batista would open Havana to large-scale gambling, and his government would match, dollar for dollar, any hotel investment over $1 million, which would include a casino license. Lansky would place himself at the center of Cuba's gambling operations. He immediately called on his associates to hold a summit in Havana. The Havana conference was held on December 22, 1946 at the Hotel Nationale. This was the first full-scale meeting of American underworld leaders since the Chicago meeting in 1932. Present were such figures as Joe Adonis, Albert Anastasia, Frank Costello, Joe Bonanno, and Vito Genovese, among other regional bosses. The first to arrive was Luciano. He secretly traveled to Havana with a false passport. Lansky shared with the attendees his vision of a new Havana, profitable for those willing to invest the right sum of money. According to Luciano, the only attendee who ever recounted the events in any detail, he was appointed as kingpin for the mob to rule from Cuba until such time as he could find a legitimate way back into the U.S. Entertainment at the conference was provided by, among others, Frank Sinatra, who flew to Cuba with his friends. Once Batista retook control of the government in a military coup in March 1952, he quickly put gambling back on track. Batista offered Lansky an annual salary of $25,000 to serve as an unofficial gambling minister. By 1955, he had changed the gambling laws once again, granting a gaming license to anyone who invested $1 million in a hotel or $200,000 in a new nightclub. Unlike the procedure for acquiring gaming licenses in Vegas, this provision exempted venture capitalists from background checks. As long as they made the required investment, they were provided with public matching funds for construction, a 10-year tax exemption, and duty-free importation of equipment and furnishings. Lansky set about reforming the Cabaret Montmartre, which soon became the in place in Havana. Lansky also installed a casino into the Hotel Nationale. Once all the new hotels, nightclubs, and casinos had been built, Batista wasted no time collecting his share of the profits. Batista's take from Lansky's casino, his prized Habana Riviera, the Nationale, the Montmartre, and others, were said to be 30%. 
what exactly Batista and his cronies allegedly received in total from the way of bribes, payoffs, and profiteering has never been certified. The slot machines alone contributed approximately $1 million to the regime's bank accounts. The 1959 Cuban Revolution and the rise of Fidel Castro changed the climate for mob investment in Cuba. On New Year's Eve 1958, while Batista was preparing to flee to the Dominican Republic, Lansky was celebrating the $3 million he made in the first year of operations at his 440-room $8 million palace, the Havana Rivera. Many of the casinos, including several of Lansky's, were looted and destroyed that night. On January 8, 1959, Castro marched into Havana and took over, setting up a command post in the Hilton. Lansky had fled the day before. The new Cuban government took steps to close the casinos. In October 1960, Castro nationalized all the island's hotel casinos and outlawed gambling. This action essentially wiped out Lansky's asset base and revenue streams. He lost an estimated $7 million, equivalent to nearly $50 million today. With the additional crackdown on casinos in Miami, Lansky was forced to depend on his Las Vegas revenues. Also, during these years, Lansky entered into legitimate ventures like cigarette machines, jukeboxes, and a short-lived investment in a company called Consolidated Television, which was selling televisions to bars. Lifelong friends Jimmy Allo and Frank Costello were partners in this business, which Lansky freely discussed when he testified in 1951 at the Kefauver hearings. The next several years found Lansky continuing to live quietly in Miami Beach and being chased by law enforcement who were anxious to finally convict him of a crime. An article written about him by journalist Hank Messick in 1965 created an aura around Lansky as a millionaire mobster whose wealth was estimated at $300 million, although this claim was never substantiated. Years later, an article was written in the Atlantic Monthly saying that Lansky is, quote, the main architect of the giant conglomerate that is organized crime in the United States. Around this time, Lansky was also purported to have said to his mob associates, quote, we're bigger than U.S. Steel. In 1970, Lansky, sensing that justice's noose was tightening around his neck, fled to Israel and sought to remain there citing the law of return, allowing any Jew to live as a citizen in the state of Israel. However, there was a clause in the law that stated that all Jews would be accepted except those who were likely to endanger public health or the security of the state. Under this clause, Lansky's petition was denied. After years of court battles, the final ruling came down from the Israeli Supreme Court in September 1972 to deny Lansky his right of citizenship, and he was ordered to leave the country. Lansky soon came back to the United States to face more prosecution attempts, but they all failed, as the government could not seem to ever make its case stick. Despite the fact that it was believed that Lansky was worth some $300 million when he died in Miami Beach of lung cancer in 1983, he left a lot of bills and seemingly no trace of his immense fortune. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more of our Mafia TV series, please like and subscribe. Until next time, Forget about it.